So a quick revision for our chapter number one, states of matter. What we're going to do is that we're going to start with the three basic states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. We're first going to discuss the arrangement of particles about this. When you talk about solid, the particles are arranged in such a way that they are tightly packed. When you melt those most solids, their volume increased slightly, but uh, the density says uh, more in solid than they are in liquid or in gases, all right? So yes. when we talk about the arrangement of particles, you'd notice that solids are tightly packed so close the particles can hardly leave their original position. For liquids, the particles are closer together, but not as close as solids were. So they can slide past one another or move past one another rather easily. As for gases, the particles are far away from one another and they usually keep traveling in straight lines, but uh, to be more precise, the particles of gas show random motion. So if according to this whole set of diagram, figure 1.4, we keep discussing the structure. So for solid, regularly packed, closer together, able to vibrate, but cannot change their fixed position. They have strong forces of attraction in them because of which the structure. For liquids, they still touch each other, but there are some gaps. So that's why liquids are less dense than solids since there are some empty spaces too. Of course, the forces of attraction are less effective as solids. The particles can move around or slide past one another, move past one another are the terms that we commonly use. And yes. again, the particles in liquid are randomly arranged. When we talk about gases, they move randomly at high speeds in all directions. They collide with one another. They collide with the walls or the lid of the container. They are much further apart from one another as compared to both liquids and solids. And there are almost no forces of attraction between them since they are so far away from one another. Now, when I say the word, I'm going through the hint right now. When I say the word packing, all right, what I'm trying to talk about is that the particles are so close and they are arranged in such a proper way that you would be able to see the layers the first layer properly arranged, the second, the third, and the particles almost touching each other. So that's yeah. why they have the least spaces in them, All right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. as per the spaces, we can't go through a solid. You may swim through a liquid. It's pretty easy to move through a gas since there's a lot of spaces between the gas particles. When so I talk about... So how do we get any sort of like uh, exam questions from those or no? Yes, exam questions usually concern the arrangement and the packing and of like course the type of motion in the particles. Like so we should when really it, describe it. Yes, yes, exactly. Oh. Or there might be an MCQ as we were just looking at one as soon as I opened the paper. I don't remember whether you did the question or not, but it was no, about packing. Okay, now when I talk about packing, the terms mm -hmm. that we use is usually uh, closed packing, closely together, packed closely together, right? And when I use the word arrangement, we commonly use the word that they are regularly arranged, all right? So yes. try using the term regular for the arrangement of solid, but it is of course irregular for liquids or gases. For solids, they are closer together. For liquids, they are somewhat close, not as close as solids, but definitely closer than the gases, all right? For gases, they are far apart from one another. And the last and most important thing that is mentioned over here are the type of motion. Now, in case of solid, I have used the word vibrate about their fixed position. In case mm -hmm. of liquids, they can move around each other. I've also used the phrase slide around each other or move past one another. And in case of gases, random motion at high speeds in all directions, all right? So we are talking about the similar stuff over here. Last but not the least, forces of attraction. Now, in case of forces of attraction, this is the fourth point in all of these uh, paragraphs. You'd notice that they talk about strong forces of attraction in solid, rather weaker forces of attraction or less effective forces of attraction in liquid. And there are almost, almost, not exactly, almost no forces of attraction in gases. So we have talked about these four properties in these paragraphs. Mm, yeah. 
<laughs> and all four of them are actually asked as questions in exams. Mm, yes. So if you know the phrases, how to describe them, it would be easier for you to describe these questions or um, answer these questions in terms of MCQs, which they are really used for. But of course, since they're a part of exams, you may face one, mm, all right? Yeah. Okay, so moving on about the kinetic energy or the movement energy. So the particles in solid have less movement energy since they can hardly leave their fixed position. Uh, in liquid, that is more energy and the highest energy is uh, in the gases, all right? So this comes as a mm -hmm. comparison, okay? Yes, okay. Now, after comparison, we come to interconversion. Of course, we can convert solids into liquids and liquids into gases or yeah, vice versa. I did, see, I did see one of those questions on the uh, past paper which you sent me. Uh, related to conversions? Yes, it was a table and we have to like write the term which is used to convert from this to this. Right, right. So uh, as far as solids and liquids are concerned, I hope you understand these terms that are given in yes. the diagram. Yes. Okay, now make sure that you do not mix any of these terms with the ones that we commonly use. Uh, these are not the ones that we usually mix since melting and freezing or melting point or freezing point are easier to describe. And solid yes. and liquid are not, is not occurring on daily basis or at any temperature since they occur at a fixed temperature, they are pretty easy to define. So I think these are easy. I do not need to go with these in detail, yes. right? Now, the ones that require detail are about these, okay? So boiling occurs at a specific temperature, which is boiling point, which is the conversion of liquid to gas, right? Mm -hmm. And yes. condensing is actually a term that we use for this point, but it's better to use the phrase liquefaction instead of condensing. It's better to use liquefaction. Liquid? liquefaction, conversion of a gas into a liquid. Oh, first time hearing this word. Right? Now, why am I coming up with this word? Let me clarify. Now, yes. uh, you do understand that liquids turn to gases. I mean, water may turn to water vapors at any temperature. Hmm. Even at room temperature, throw some water on a dry floor, and after some time, that would water would evaporate. Yes. If the temperature is a little bit hot, that would evaporate quickly. If the temperature is a little bit cold, it might take some time, but eventually it would dry, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's, it is occurring at any temperature, we do not use the term boiling for it. Instead, the term we use is evaporation. And if the same thing happens at, 100 degrees centigrade, which is the boiling point of water, right? Then on, only then we use the term boiling. So evaporation and boiling are the same phase changes, but evaporation occurs at any temperature and boiling occurs at boiling point. Mm. Yes. When I talk about the vice versa, when I talk about the opposite, this may occur as well as this may occur too, for this, the opposite is condensation or condensing, which it was written over there. But this one has a name and that is liquefaction, which occurs at a specific temperature point. Mm. And yes. this thing uh, for evaporation has been explained over here. Right? So condensation yes. and evaporation may occur at any temperature but boiling specifically occurs at boiling point, liquefaction specifically occurs at liquefying point, where a gas is converted into a liquid at liquefying point, or a liquid is converted into gas at boiling point. So I made like a short note on uh, evaporation, and I like, I'm gonna read it out and see if it's correct or not. Sure, go ahead. Uh, evaporation is the process where liquid turn into into vapor. It occurs it occurs on the surface of liquid as it changes into into gas phase, 
uh, when particles um, near the sur uh, surface absorb enough energy to overcome viper uh, pressure, it will escape and enter surrounding um, arrangements. Yeah. Okay, let's change it a little bit. Uh, yes. After the word overcome, don't write uh, whatever you have written. Instead, write forces of attraction. Wait, overcome? You use the word overcome in the last oh, line. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. After overcome, what have you written? The exact words after overcome? Overcome, uh, wiper. Mm -hmm. No, uh, wiper actually, pressure. don't write vapor pressure. Overcome. Forces of attraction. Forces. They don't need to overcome the vapor pressure. They actually need to overcome the forces of attraction of the nearby molecules. Oh, yes. Okay. So okay. overcome forces of attraction. The rest is yes. correct. And what was the last line? Uh, last line, I, mean, I did not understand it. I just wrote it. So it is um, when particles and here the surface. Uh, surface absorb enough enough energy to force of attraction pressure it will escape and and, uh, okay, okay. and enter. Uh, remove the pressure um, force of attraction it was the whole term instead of vapor pressure not just vapor so also yes, remove okay. the word pressure out of it hmm. okay done okay good and i think the last lines were uh, and they enter the surrounding spaces right Surrounding arrangements. Yes. Sorry, my bad. Surrounding arrangements. Yes. Cut the word arrangements. Surrounding is enough. Okay. Okay. Yes. And that's right. Yeah. Now, thank you. Ed, uh, in between any of these, if you're talking about evaporation, you need to mention at any temperature. Since this is a mm -hmm. very important phrase to mention. So we can write like evaporation is a process where a liquid turn to a uh, viper in any temperature? At any temperature, right. And fine. the rest is fine. And the rest is fine. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right. So moving on. Yeah. And this is evaporation explained. That evaporation is different. It can occur at any temperature, so on and so forth. Yes. Okay. Particles moving, escaping from the surface to form a gas, right? Yes. And evaporation and condensation are opposite to one another. Is also mentioned over here, and both processes may be occurring in a closed container. All right. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. So if you're clear about these, let's talk about the next one. From yes. so solid directly into gas. If the mm -hmm. solid is converted into gas directly by bypassing the liquid state, that means you won't be able to see the liquid state from these specific solids. And there are very less examples in your book since everything does not sublime, only a few substances does, we'll call that sublimation. And the reversal mm -hmm. would be known as deposition. Okay, now the reverse it definitely is known as deposition. Okay, mm -hmm. sometimes they use the word desublimation. Yes, and yes. sometimes they use the word sublimation again. So that's fine. Think, if they use the I, word deposition or desublimation or sublimation, all three yes, of them I, are correct. I, I think I saw this from your video actually, and I wrote it down. Okay, good, good. Then let's move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. One of the examples of sublimation is carbon dioxide. Solid carbon dioxide is known as dry ice. This is a common thing as a part of past papers as shown over here too, all right? Mm -hmm. Other examples, iodine. This would another be another example which you'll see in your book as well as in your past papers. Uh, this was the second example. The third example you are going to see in like, your book. Turn to dry ice? Yeah, the solid form of carbon dioxide is known as dry ice because it looks like ice. The only difference is that it's dry, it's not wet. Like the ice made out of water is wet, the ice made out of carbon dioxide is dry. So we call it dry ice. Yes, okay. 
Okay. So the examples for sublimation are number one, carbon dioxide, of course, CO2. The second example is iodine. The third example is ammonium chloride. There are a total of three of these examples in your book. So make sure you note yes. them down. Yes. Since you're going okay. to face them in the later parts of the book. Hmm. Okay. Now. One important part, and you'd see this question a lot in past papers, that is working out a physical state of a substance at a particular temperature. Now, that particular temperature would be given as a part of question. What other pieces of information would be given in the question? The melting point and the boiling point. These two pieces of information would be given as a part of the question. Mm. Okay, let's say for the melting point of uh, oxygen and boiling point is given, as a part of the question, how would you work out that what is the state of oxygen at a specific temperature? Let's say at room temperature, what would be the state of oxygen at room temperature? Do you know how so to work are, this out? So there are three, right? One is melting point, one is boiling point, and one is room temperature, right? Room temperature is the particular temperature that I am giving you as a part of the question. And the other two are the prerequisites that you require in order to answer the question perfectly. And yes, so, these are three right. So um, do they give like two of them and we have to find one of them? Is no. it like this? No, they are going to give you three temperature values. Huh? The melting point, the boiling point, and any third temperature value. Like I gave you the value of room temperature. And yes. you need to tell me at this temperature, what would be the physical state? Is it a solid, is it a liquid, or would it be a gas at this specific temperature? Hmm. So at room temperature, let's say that is 20 degrees centigrade, all right? Uh, let's write it over here. At 20 degrees centigrade, would oxygen be a gas, a liquid, or a solid? Working out the physical state. So you need to mention the physical state as your answer. Hmm. Yes. Do you know how to do that? Uh, no. Okay. There is a simple piece of hint that I'm going to give you. And I, I think that is also given in the book. Okay, so um, let's say this particular temperature is given as a part of the question. If that particular temperature, I'm writing it as a short form part temperature, it's particular temperature, mm -hmm. just to save time, you cannot actually use the short form in exams. So if yes. the particular temperature is greater than both melting points and boiling points, take it, the substance is a gas. Can if the particular, I, I am going to just write these first and then we're going to practice all three of these as a, since I'm going to write three of these, we're going to practice this from this number line. So for now, yeah. let's write the rules. This is the first rule. This is the second rule. Let's write the third one. And then we're going to practice all three of these. All right, just a minute. If the particular temperature is smaller than both melting point and boiling point, of course, then the substance is a gas, a solid at that, that very temperature. All right, and mm -hmm. number three, if that particular temperature is greater than the melting point, but it's smaller than the boiling point, I mean, it lies right in between both, then that substance is a liquid at that temperature. All right? So which means they're going to give you three values in question. In question, they're going to give you the melting point, they are going to give you the boiling point and they are going to give you the particular temperature. And what you are supposed to answer is the state of matter at that particular temperature as per from its melting point and boiling point. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. pretty easy. If the particular temperature is bigger than these two values, gas. If the particular temperature is smaller than these two values, solid. If the particular temperature is bigger than melting point, but smaller than boiling point, of course, that's going to be a liquid at that specific temperature. Now, yes. let's go through these points from this number line. Have you written these points, these three points? Yes. Okay. But I, didn't, I wasn't able to understand what you wrote in the third one. So if you could like say it again, so I'll write it. 
I, I'm going to give you an example right now. Yeah, okay. Or do you need to write these first? I want to write these first so then I can apply. Okay, take your time. When you're done writing, let me know. No, no, no. Just say me what you wrote because I did not understand what you wrote. I wrote particular temperature and then this is a sign for greater than. I yes. hope you're familiar with the greater than sign. Yes, this is yes. a greater than sign, right? Greater than yes. melting point, MP stands for melting point and sign BP stands for boiling point. That your answer should be gas. This is a hint. This is a tip. You're not going to write this as a part of your answer in exams. You're actually yes. going to work on this tip to answer your questions. All right? Yes. Okay. So I wrote particular temperature is greater than melting point and boiling point. Then the answer is supposed to be gas. Hmm. That was number one. Number two yes. is particular temperature is smaller than, since this is the smaller than sign, is smaller than melting point and boiling point, then it's a solid. The, your answer should be solid. Number yes. three, if the particular temperature is greater than the melting point and smaller than the boiling point, right? Then your mm -hmm. answer is supposed to be liquid. Since you can only have three answers, solid, liquid, or gas. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. If you now understand it, let's take the example of oxygen. We're going to take example of oxygen. The melting point is somewhere we can say minus 210. Let's assume it for now. We're resuming it. And the boiling point is around 190 degrees centigrade. I assume this value as well as this one, right? Yes. Let's say as a first question, the particular temperature that he gives you as a part of question is room temperature, which is 20 degrees centigrade. So what would be the state of matter of oxygen at 20 degree? Now compare this temperature with these two values and answer me according to these three rules. Okay. So, um, minus 210 degrees Celsius. So the boiling point is negative 190 degrees centigrade. The melting point is negative 210 degrees centigrade, all right? And the yeah. particular temperature is 20 degrees centigrade. So what is your answer for the state of uh, matter at this specific temperature? Is the value 20 degree greater than both melting point and boiling point? Is it smaller yes. than both melting point and boiling point? What is it then? It's a greater than the melting and the boiling point, right? So as per these three rules, what should be the state of matter? And uh, yes, you're gas? right. Yes, that's what uh, you're supposed to answer. That's how the question would be asked. They'll give you a particular temperature and they like you to compare it with melting point and boiling point of a specific substance. Compare it. Mm. If the value is bigger than both melting and boiling point, your answer should be gas. If the value is smaller, your answer should be solid. If the value is in between, your answer should be liquid. I'm going to give you a second value this time, all right? This time, yes. the particular temperature value given to you is a little bit difficult. They ask you mm -hmm. what would be the state of matter at negative 200, sorry, my bad, negative 250 degrees centigrade. What mm -hmm. would be the state of matter of oxygen at negative 250 degrees centigrade? Mm, okay, wait. So. So out of the three cases that I gave you, Which case are we facing right now? Mm. Until you finalize the answer, I'm going to get a glass of water. Yeah, sure. You can tell me the answer as soon as you're finalized. Yes, yes.
So what you are supposed to do is to compare whether negative 250 is greater than negative 190 and 210 or okay. is smaller or something in between. That's what you need to figure out. Okay, okay. So I'm not sure, but uh, will the answer be solid? Perfect. Why do you think the answer is solid? First, you're right. Secondly, why? It's because um, as you wrote the rules over there and you said that it, if the temperature if the temperature of boil uh, melting and boiling point is like, um, what do I say, greater, I guess? No, no, no. no Wait. Smaller. Smaller? Actually, right, smaller than. So smaller actually this than... particular temperature, negative 250, is smaller than both negative 210 and negative 150. All right? Yes. So yeah. that's why it would be solid at that temperature. Now, let me give you a third question. The third question is when the particular temperature is negative 200 degrees centigrade. What about the state of matter now? Okay, so melting, so it's in between, right? Right, and in this so case? It is uh, liquid. Perfect. This number line is given for you to properly imagine whether the number is gonna be bigger or smaller. The bigger numbers are given in mostly in red, the smaller numbers are given uh, mostly in uh, greens. That's the last temperatures uh, number that you, they can use. So let's talk about bromine then, all right? Since you have mm -hmm. answered correctly for oxygen, let's talk about bromine. So let's yeah. say that the melting point of bromine is negative 10 degrees centigrade for the sake of understanding. And the boiling point is around 60 degrees centigrade, all right? Yeah. So question number one, what would be the state of matter of bromine if we take its state of matter at 100 degrees centigrade? The particular temperature is 100 degrees centigrade. So the, so the room temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. No, no, the room temperature is not 100. The particular temperature at which we are measuring the state of matter for bromine is 100. Room temperature always stays the same. It always stays over here. It never changes. The particular uh, temperature is 100 degrees centigrade. The temperature oh, okay. at which you are supposed to answer the question is 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, 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 okay. So um, which of them is melting and which one is the boiling point? It's written right here. This one is the melting point and I have wrote okay. it over here. This one is the boiling point. I wrote it over here. Okay. So, um, 60 degrees Celsius. So, so, um, the particular uh, temperature is is greater than the melting point, right? And uh, smaller than the boiling point? No. Wait. This is 100. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. Okay, so it's greater than uh, melting and boiling point. Right, so the state of matter should be? Uh, gas. Perfect. What if yes. I change my question to negative 100? Okay, so it will be... Um, as as it will be then smaller than both, right? Right. So then it will be, wait. So it will be solid? Right. Yes. So what if what would be the state of matter if I ask you the state of matter at room temperature? Remember, the room temperature is 25 degrees centigrade. We may also take the value 20 degree or 25 degrees centigrade. That's, it's fine with both values. Usually it's yes. around 20, 25 degrees centigrade. Hmm. Since it's also mentioned over here, room temperature can be taken anywhere in between 20 and 25. That's why I'm writing both, hmm. right? Okay. Hmm. So what about this? Um, second. Okay. So uh, the room temperature which is 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, it will be 
it will be uh, smaller than the melting point. Smaller than the boiling point. It's oh, smaller towards oh, yes, this yes. side, okay? Actually, oh. and larger towards this side. I get confused in this one. Okay. These are just numbers. You know 350 is bigger than 300, right? Yes. So it should be easy. So at 20 or 25 degrees centigrade room temperature, the state of matter would be? Mm. Liquid? Perfect. Great, because okay. it's smaller than the boiling point and it's bigger than the melting point. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. Yes. So I think you're clear with the examples. Good enough? Yeah. Yes. Good. So I'm going to erase all of it. Can I? Yes, sure. And let's move forward. Okay. So now, next topic is diffusion. Diffusion is the random motion of particles. We do understand that that motion is always from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. They actually try to spread, right? And that spreading out is known as diffusion. I'm not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Uh, excuse me, sir, I'm not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Is it yes. better? Yes, yes. All right. So I was saying that diffusion is actually spreading out of particles, and it is always from an area of high concentration to an area mm -hmm. of low concentration. And they try to spread out in this way. The process is known as diffusion. And they'll keep spreading out until they are evenly spread throughout. Throughout the room, for example. Right. For example, the room, for example, it could be a cylinder, it could be a whole room, it could be in any container, anything like it can that. Be a, it can be a lab. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Any of those examples are correct as containers. Now, I do hope and understand that particles of different gases travel at different speeds. Why is that? I usually tend to explain it as per their masses. Some particles are heavy, some particles are lighter. So from their speeds, we can get an idea. For example, we took a cotton wool soaked in ammonia solution. This is the formula for ammonia solution. We took another cotton wool and we soaked it in hydrochloric acid solution. This is the example of hydrochloric acid. And we understood that they reacted somewhere here. So we understand this is a lower side of traveling and this is a longer side of traveling. So ammonia solution traveled longer as compared to hydrochloric acid solution. So what do we deduce from it? We deduce that this one's lighter and this one's heavier. You might have Wait. noticed that. So the place, uh, so the like the, the, the place which is like left means how much they have to travel, but we, we can like see to that and then we can know, right? There is actually a white ring formed over here. Yes. And the ring forms uh, from the reaction of both the gases. It gives the idea that hydrochloric acid has traveled less distance and ammonia hmm. solution had traveled more distance. Why? Because it was lighter and it was heavier. And so in, probably from the video you remember, you might remember that I said, fat people run a little slower and actually slim people can run a bit faster. Though I oh, wasn't yeah. trying to hate fat people, but what I was trying to say was that the lighter thing can travel faster. So, right, it can travel faster. It traveled more distance and the heavy thing was traveling slower. So it covered less distance. So that's what we can deduce from the distance or what they have covered. Hmm. Although we yes. don't know about the masses of hydrochloric acid and ammonia so far, we haven't studied it yet. But of course, you can deduce that this gas is lighter in mass and this gas is heavier in mass. You can hmm. easily deduce that hydrochloric acid is a, a fat gas and ammonia is a slim gas. Easy enough? <laughs> yes. 
I'm not trying to hit any specific kind of people. People call that racism. <laughs> it's not racism. No. I'm just trying to make it funnier and easier for students to remember. All right? Yes. Not yes. hitting on any fat students or slim students at all. Okay, yeah. so I hope you do get the point, and it's it would be easier for you to remember how to deduce the result. Yeah. Okay. okay. Diffusion may also occur in liquids. It's a little bit slower. It takes a lot of time. For example, that if there is a liquid, a, a gas jar of water, and at the bottom we add a small jar of a colored solution, the color would spread throughout the whole jar, but it would take some time for it to happen. It might yeah. take a few minutes or maybe a few hours at that. Yes, right? okay. In order to do it quickly, what do we do? We stir it. Stirring actually helps with the diffusion process. It increases mm -hmm. the rate of diffusion. If you don't stir it, it would uh, actually take a longer duration of time, mm -hmm. right? So this is also known as dilution of colored solution. We can dilute the colored solutions. And what happens if you dilute the color solutions? They are what darker. Does that mean? Sorry? What does that mean that dilute? Um, I don't know what you said that one. What does it mean? Dilution means a process, process <laughs> of adding more water to a solution. All right. This is what mm -hmm. the word dilution means. Okay. I, mm, yes. There is already a solution. And if we add more water to it, what would happen? The darker color will fade to a lighter color. Right? Yes. 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 I hope you already know that. Uh, yes. We commonly have syrups at home from which, if we add water, we can make juices out of them. Uh, like and tank. the more right like tang. now you have powders you can mix those powders in water if you use less amount of water that powder is going to give you a dark solution and if you use a lot of water that same amount of water is going to give you a lighter or a faded solution right yes 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 so now you understand the steps of dilution so the more yes. water you're going to add the more would be the color change but it's not just the color change that we're going to work with it. Even we're taste. going to work out other things as well. So as oh. far as the other things are concerned, let's discuss it. Now, imagine you dissolve only 0 0.01 grams of your solid powder in one cubic centimeter of water. It would make a deep purple solution, a dark color. Now, if we take a volume of one drop as 0 0.05 cubic centimeter, we can work out there are 20 drops in one cubic centimeter. Right? Because one divided by 0 0.05 is 20. Do you get the point? Uh, yes. Okay. So we are actually working out the number of drops. So each drop contains this much amount of potassium manganese. We also divide this by 20. This gives us the answer. Right? Do you get the point? Can you repeat that again, once again, like how you Okay, can let, let me clarify over here. So now mm -hmm. we were talking about one cubic centimeter of water. We, want, we knew that one drop is equal to 0 0.05 cubic centimeter. So now we know that one cubic centimeter is equal to 20 drops, mm. right? Yes. Okay. So we started off with 0 0.01 grams in one cubic centimeter. That was the amount that we used. Yes. Since one cubic centimeter is equal to 0 0.01 gram and one cubic centimeter if divided by 20 gives us one drop. So one drop would be equal to what? We need to divide this by 20 as well. And that is 0 0.0005. Makes sense? So they can, they can give any like any number for the drops, right? Then we have to divide an answer. 
Right. Drops is a way of telling you that we can bifurcate any value to a smaller fraction, to a smaller hmm. numbering. All right. Yes. And then yes. you might have to answer that how would that thing work for masses that you have dissolved? Let me give you another example as a question so that you can actually work it out for yourself. Now, um, I used 20 grams in 100 cubic centimeter of water. All right. Mm -hmm. So if you only have one cubic centimeter of that water, how many grams would be here? Right. Okay, so first I think uh, we will... Uh... It can easily be solved by a ratio method. The same ratio method I explained on our last day of working. You need to figure out by which value he divided this number to get this answer. He divided oh. 100 out of 100 to get this one, right? So we need to divide this one by, by the same value. So if you divide 20 out of 100, what could be your answer? Then you can take the help of a calculator and calculate your answer. And if you do that, that would be... Okay, if you well, have, have a calculator okay. nearby, it would be really easy for you to answer me. Okay, okay. Uh, one second, I'll, I'll test uh, bring it, okay? One uh, go grab the calculator, that's fine. Oh, okay, so I should find with which number I should divide 100, uh, 100 centimeter cube right. to get on the answer <laughs> one. Oh, okay. But that's something uh, somewhat difficult to do. You can use the ratio method. I told you that you can easily use the ratio method for water and for mass for 100 cubic centimeter of water. We have the huh. mass 20 grams for one yeah. cubic centimeter. We don't know the mass and we need to find it out. That's X. Divide these two values, change the places. 100 would be equal to 20 multiplied by one over 100. And X, if you do it like this or you do it like this, your answer would be same. So either you can figure out the number, this number was divided to get the answer of one, or you can do it by the ratio method that I already told you on the last working day. Since this method can easily be, be applied to most of your working solutions, like this one. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the answer in this case would be? Mm, one second, I'm just doing it. Um... Sure, take your time. So is the answer 0 0.2? Perfect, the answer is 0 0.2. Whether you write it over here in terms of grams or you write it over here, the answer is actually the same. So we should just give it... Uh, yeah. Either you figure out the number, this number was divided by it to get this answer, or you can rearrange the whole things into the ratio method. Both ways you can get your answer. It's up to you which method you'd like to apply. Yes, okay. It's really up to the student which one he, he or she finds easier. Hmm, okay. Okay. And you notice the same kind of explanation over here. All right. So we hmm. can actually always work with smaller parts of the solution. That's what he tend to ask. Well, the questions from this part are actually pretty rare in past paper exams. So let's move mm -hmm. on. Let's not pay too much time to this one. Moving on, solubility of solids. You know okay. that the substance we dissolve is solute. The liquid we dissolve it in is the solvent. And whatever we form as a result is known as a solution. This is important, These are the basic right? definitions. What's more important, right, you're right. What's more important mm -hmm. is that 
you know how to bifurcate it into different types. Hmm. Now, there are a few types given over here, but if you go through my video, I have given more types. For example, I have discussed dilute and concentrated solutions, right? In my videos, mm -hmm. I have discussed these ones like saturated and unsaturated solutions. So we should figure it out if it's a solvent solution or like, like this, we have to figure it out? No, these things are too easy. They usually do not ask this kind of question in exams. Any student yes. can easily figure out which one's solute, which one's solvent, and which one's the solution. Usually the mm -hmm. solute is in less amount, the solvent is in more amount. Usually the solute is the substance which is being dissolved and a, a solvent is the substance, is the liquid it is being dissolved in. So it's pretty easy for students to figure out these. So they do mm -hmm. not ask it as a question since that would be uh, too easier of a level. All right. So what they did to ask you about is these definitions out of which he explained a few only. He only explained saturated and saturated over here. So we should give the definition of those? No, you need to understand the concept so that you can know where to use these words. All right. So I'm going to define these words for you. Dilute and concentrated are actually a comparison of solutions. Right. So if I take five grams of salt and I divide and I dissolve it in 100 grams of water mm. in one beaker and in the second beaker of the same size, I take the same amount of water, but this time I dissolve a different amount of salt. Now, can you tell me out of these two, which one's the con dilute solution and which one is the concentrated solution? That is something you should know from this topic. Okay, so... Um... I do not like understand how can we know like... Okay, let me define, define it then. Dilute solution yeah. has more solute, sorry, more solvent or less solute or concentrated solutions are the one which have less solvent or more solute. Okay, yes. so I've dis discussed two cases in both. Now you'd notice that you cannot bifurcate this case on the basis of solvent. In both the cases, the solvent is water, right? So we cannot mm -hmm. use this or this. However, the salt is the solute in both the cases and that can be differentiated since one of them is using less amount of salt and one of them is using more amount of salt, right? Mm -hmm. So one of them has less solute and one of them has more solute. Which one has more solute? Um, is it a uh, dilute? No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. It's not dilute, it's the another one. And which one is that? Five gram salt or 10 gram salt? 10. 10 gram salt. And what is 10 gram salt? A concentrated solution or a dilute solution? Uh, concentrated. Right, that's how you know. So you will call this solution a concentrated solution as compared to this one. Remember, it's a comparison always. Okay, let's take another set of comparison. I took five grams of sugar and I dissolved it in 10 cubic centimeter of water in one case. Then I took the same utensil and I added the same amount of sugar in 20 cubic centimeter of water. Which one of these is dilute and which one of these is a concentrated solution? Okay, so... Um... This time the case is different. This time you have the same amount of the solute. This time the solvent is what is different. Remember the solvent is the liquid that we are using 
in this case okay. and the liquid so here is, is water so is it i think it's uh, dilute which one is dilute can you mention um the one with 20 cubic centimeter of water or the one with 10 cubic centimeter of water which one is dilute 10 it has more solvent reconsider please since you're not mm -hmm. right remember dilute has more solvent it means it has more water so which one is dilute which one has more water in it um five um, um gram of sugar and 25 uh like the cubic this one, so, right yes this one is dilute and this one is concentrated makes uh, sense so you say so you said that dilute have more amount of water right yeah more solvent as i stated over here dilute has either more solvent or less solute one of these should work okay there are two principles for dilute and two for concentrated if you're comparing in terms of solvent more solvent is dilute and less solvent is concentrated if you're comparing in terms of solute less solute is dilute and more solute is concentrated this is yes. the comparison in terms of solute theek hai and this is the comparison in terms of solvent right because water is the solvent or salt and sugar are the solute does yes, that okay. make sense क्योंकि दोनों केसेस में वाटर वो लिक्विड है जिसमें सॉल्ट या शुगर डिजोल्व हो रहे हैं तो वाटर हमेशा सॉल्वेंट रहेगा सॉल्ट या शुगर सोल्यूट बन जाएंगे अगर ये क्लियर हो गया तो सैटरडेटेड एंड सैचुरेटेड डिफाइन करें ऑल्दो इट्स अब टाइम लेकिन सैचुरेटेड एंड सैचुरेटेड के बाद फिर क्लास ऑफ कर देते हैं राइट so okay. i'm going to raise these okay and these two so that i can define the saturated and unsaturated now i'm going to go with the definition a saturated solution is a solution which contains as much dissolved solid as possible at a particular time there must be some undissolved solute present okay so what i did is that i took a beaker and i took 100 grams of water in it so much so the beaker right. almost came up to full and then i started adding salt to it right i first added 5 yeah. grams of salt i stirred it the salt dissolved i added another 5 grams to it i stirred it dissolved i added, added another 5 grams of it i stirred a lot but it did not completely dissolve some of the salt settled so at the bottom I This think kind of I, solution I, will be known as. Okay, so the one as you said in the beaker, if we add salt and we mix it, if it dissolves and we add more and then we add more, so so then it will be like dissolving, uh, so it will be saturated, right? It would become saturated once it so stops dissolving the salt. then okay. it would be known as saturated because yeah. at that point it would contain as much dissolved solid as it possibly could at that yes. particular okay. temperature okay so we, uh, when we take the beaker and then again we will add salt amount of salt and then we mix it and it stops like when dissolving and the particles of this salt would be like settled down at the bottom right as it said there must be some undissolved solute present at the bottom so then it becomes a saturated Only, uh, solution like uh, the down like, yes because uh, um, because this salt won't be able to uh, dissolve dissolve any more right right so i took another same container i mm -hmm. took 100 grams of water i started adding salt to it i just added 5 grams of salt to it it completely dissolved in it what would i call this solution then i'll call this solution as unsaturated solution why would i call it unsaturated 
because it never right. tried to add more and maybe it dissolved more salt then it, so it if it can dissolve more salt to it it's unsaturated because so it hasn't it dissolved won't... the maximum amount of salt that it could because if so... i added 5 more grams of it it would still dissolve so that's why it's unsaturated so, uh, when... Um, like as you say that if we want to just uh, dissolve a certain amount and it got and it gets like dissolved so it will be unsaturated right right okay i explain it in a much different way all right because since we're talking about salts and water and solutions it becomes a little difficult for my students to understand it so i come up with some easier some mouth watering examples nowadays yeah. students usually love pizzas right pizza is something that should be loved since it's so tasty and yummy and whatever all right so nowadays what we usually do is that we tend to divide pizzas into uh, let's say six pieces right so i divided this pizza into six pieces okay yes yeah. so let's say uh, you and your siblings are competing theek you and some of your naughty siblings usually in my videos you'll find the siblings naughty and irritating i don't know whether that's the reality but you'll find this with my videos okay let's say that after eating three slices you become full right hmm. and then there is a naughty sibling who can eat as much as up to five slices let's call the yes. sibling naughty let's call call the sibling fatty anything you'd like to call the sibling for all right he he or she becomes yeah. full at five slices so yeah. i'll use the term saturated if if you only have eaten three slices if you have eaten one i'll call it unsaturated since you have it's the because, space to eat more it, it's because as we eat three slices uh, like slices and we're full so we're not able to eat any more right, right? so if yeah. you're not able to dissolve any more it's saturated only then if you can dissolve yes. anything then uh, if you can dissolve any more then it's unsaturated so at, after eating one slice you're at an unsaturated phase after eating two slices you're still at unsaturated phase only when you're done sli eating three slices you'll be at the saturated phase yes. in case of your sibling it's different after one slice unsaturated after two still unsaturated after three still unsaturated naughty <laughs> after four still unsaturated fatty <laughs> after five then your sibling becomes uh, saturated i hope you yes. get the point now yes yes okay there is another type but we're going to do it a little later not at this part of the book but i usually explain that type that is known as super saturated Oh yes. You will also come across this type uh, that is when you dissolve more than what you can dissolve as saturated solution. And you do it by increasing the temperature. Increasing the temperature. Oh yeah, so when uh, like when we on dissolve heat like the solution up and we can dissolve yes. more. Yes, yes. Right? Let's say mm -hmm. this whole a uh, three slices five slices thing i come up with a bet and i say if you eat more slices you will be rewarded with money then mm -hmm. even when you're full at three slices you will try to eat more you might be able yeah. to uh, successfully eat four slices or five slices just to win the bet mm -hmm. then in that yeah. case i'll call you super saturated yes Okay. now the reward was money this time in case of solutions the reward is not money the condition is increasing the temperature hmm. there is a very famous pakistani sweet by the name of jalebi i hope you are familiar with it jalebis have you ever eaten jalebis oh uh, yes okay jalebis are actually made of sugar syrup how do we make a sugar yes. syrup we take a huge amount uh, of sugar a little amount of water it. and we dissolve it by heating the water yes yes so that uh, then dissolve that kind of dissolving is then known as super saturated solutions 
right? because the time, oh, oh, because we increase the temperature and then it got like more dissolved, right? And we even dissolved more than what a saturated solution can. Let's hmm. say a saturated solution can only dissolve a total of 15 grams, and we were capable of dissolving 25 grams just because we were able to increase the temperature. Hmm. Yes. Which means, which actually brings us to the next topic, solubility, which will clearly tell you that we are capable of dissolving more than the saturated solutions by increasing temperature. Hmm. Make sense? Yes. Good, good, great. The next topic would be solubility. And we'll discuss how we uh, define solubility. And he'll tell you the whole experiment of solubilities. I hope you'll get it. Sorry, my bad. And then the curves. I've already explained the curves, so this part shouldn't be difficult for you, right? Yes. Good. I hope you'll be able to do the investigation of how to investigate the solubility of a solid. Yes, will okay. you be able to do it on your own? Yes, I can. 